2 Samuel chapter 22. Second Samuel chapter 22. We're looking at the song, the hymn that David wrote. It says in verse 1 that he spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. So the psalm is a song that David sang to the Lord, that we have the privilege of knowing the words of this worship that David had before the Lord. We looked uh, last week, and beginning in verse 20, he brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands has he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was upright before him and have kept myself from my iniquity. And therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness, my cleanness in his eyesight. And all of this can be um, studied in this 119th Psalm in which David praises the word of God in every verse and talks about his own love for the word of God. It's a description of a child of God. It's a description of a man who loves the Lord and who is seeking to obey the Lord, seeking the Lord's will and uh, asking God to help him in all things. And then he goes on to say in verse 26, So with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. And with the upright man, you will show yourself upright. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the froward, you will show yourself unsavory. So he talks about two different kinds of persons here. Uh, The one is the believer who loves the Lord and uh, the Lord's relationship to that believer. The other one is the man who uh, mocks God in his relationship to that man. Because he says in verse 28, and the afflicted people, which is a description of the saints, you will save. But thine eyes are upon the haughty that you may bring them down, showing God's purpose toward the proud. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by you I have run through a troop, by my God I have leaped over a wall. And then verse 31, kind of like titling the the sermon from verse 31, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler, a shield to all those who trust in him. God's ways are perfect. God's ways are perfect and his word is tried. His word is tried. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the encouragement in it, for the instruction in it. We pray that you would open up your truth to us now and uh, cause us to rejoice in it, cause us to understand your word and make application in our own heart. May we be like David was, a man after God's own heart. Uh, maybe, may we be one who strives after uh, righteousness to do the will of the Lord, to honor you and obey you in all things. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So David's uprightness is proclaimed by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, who directed David in these words. And there is show yourself merciful, this idea in verse, um, as he, in verse 26, he says, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. You will show yourself merciful. With the kind, with the merciful, you will show yourself kind and merciful. 
Turn to James chapter 2. We'll keep a finger in 2 Samuel. We'll be back there in James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has shown no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. For he shall have judgment without mercy who has shown no mercy. Here's the negative side of it, which is given to us a couple of times in the scriptures in Matthew chapter 7, it talks about harsh judgment, judge not that you be not judged, a greatly abused verse, but still a verse that teaches that those who judge harshly, that they will experience that themselves. It'll come back on them. And judgment without mercy. So that's the negative side of it. Our text gives us the positive side because it's talking about in three ways who, what God is to us as the saints as those who show mercy because we've been shown the mercy of God, as those who are upright because we have a new principle within us so that we seek to live out the truth, as those who are pure, who seek to be set apart unto God from this world. And for those, it gives us the relationship of God toward us, that the Lord is merciful. It says, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. Interesting that in, also in the book of James, the fifth chapter, that James uses the example of Job, James chapter 5. In verse... 10, it says, take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, and you have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So that he says, in our text, it says, with the merciful you show yourself merciful which doesn't mean that we will not experience afflictions and that sort of thing. But what he is saying is this man, this renewed man, the man who belongs to God, who is a child of God, whom God is his father, James uses the example of Job and shows how Job throughout all of his afflictions, he says, you see the end of the Lord. You see what the end is. The end is that God is merciful. God is gracious to his children. Uh, even if the end of a child of God is martyrdom, God is gracious to his children. He receives them into eternal glory. Indeed, he even gives them a greater reward, the scripture speaks of. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, Verse 25, I suppose that necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, your messenger, he that ministered to my wants. He longed after you all. He was full of heaviness because you heard that he had been sick. For indeed, and that shows the mercy of the children of God. Here they sent a messenger to Paul. Paul, he's ministering to Paul. He falls ill, apparently very ill. And the church is concerned, very concerned. And so then... Epaphroditus is concerned about the concern of the church. The children of God are full of mercy. It says he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because you heard he was sick. For indeed he was sick, dying to death, but God had mercy on him. And not him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And I sent him back the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be the less sorrowful. So... They worried about Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus worried about them, and Paul worried about them as well. Everybody was concerned about everybody else, and that is the state of the church. And that is the state of the heart of the children of God. They're a merciful people. And, the, and our text says that to the merciful, God shows mercy. He shows mercy. And there, for Epaphroditus, it said God had mercy on him. How many times does God have mercy on us to raise us up when we're sick? A sickness which 
Any sickness could end, issue forth a death eventually if it remains and is not cured. And so how often God shows us that mercy. And in the text, within the text, another text, the children of God ascribe these things to God. They, they, don't, they don't live in a world as if everything is just chance. They understand that God is in control of all these things. To the merciful, you show yourself merciful. And the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, um, if ever we should doubt the mercy of God, we just need to read the Gospels of Jesus Christ. Where he went about doing good, he showed mercy upon the leper, upon the blind man. It was almost like a millennium in his day because there were so many being healed and cared for. He cared even for the physical aspects of the man, uh, though the spiritual aspects were the most prominent and the most important in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 23, the Pharisees are, are condemned by Christ. Matthew 23, they were an unmerciful people. They didn't really care about their charges. They didn't care about the people that were under them. They cared about themselves. Matthew 23 and verse 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done and not left the others undone. So he describes mercy as a weightier matter of the law. And so the saints, the true saints, are people who show mercy, who love mercy. And, uh, and God puts back into their bosom mercy as well. Um, they, they, they are made aware of the mercy of God. They are made aware of how gracious God is to them over and over again. Indeed, in the Sermon on the Mount, I, I saw certain connections between our psalm here, Psalm 18 or first, Second Samuel 22, between that and the Sermon on the Mount, because in the Sermon on the Mount it says, blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. They shall receive mercy. And God says he will have mercy and not sacrifice. So in our text, he says, and it's a kind of law of God in the way that he deals with his dear children. Richard Steele writes, if man will deal plainly with God, God will deal plainly with them. He that is upright in performing his duty shall find God upright in performing his promises. It is God's way to carry men. It is God's way to carry to men as they carry to him. If thou hast a design to please him, he will have a design to please thee. If thou wilt echo to him when he calls, he'll echo to you when you call a kind of law of God. So he says, with the merciful, you show yourself mercy. And with the upright man or the sincere man, you show yourself upright or sincere. The sincere man will find God dealing sincerely with him. The saints find this. They have an implicit trust in God and that God is, in everything that God is doing toward them, it is in sincerity. Because God loves sincerity and rewards sincerity and he dwells with the sincere. And God will pour out his help and his secrets to those who sincerely seek him. He, he commends Nathaniel. Jesus loved Nathaniel, who was without guile. He was a sincere man. And sometimes we are sincere and sincerely wrong and God will correct us, but he still loves us for that sincerity. He still loves us for the fact that even when we were wrong, we were seeking to do the right thing, though we needed to be corrected about it. Because we can be corrected. Because we do sincerely want to be right. Why it says in John chapter 3 that we bring things to the light. The world hide things from the light. Why? Because they're not sincere about any improvements or about pleasing God. But we bring things to the light because we are sincerely following God and we want to be right in the things that we're doing. And so with the upright, he shows himself upright. Peter says that those 
who desire the sincere milk of the word, word shall be filled with it. They shall be nourished. That the Lord Jesus him Christ, Lord Jesus Christ himself was without guile. He, of all men, he was without guile. No hypocrisy. There was nothing but sincerity. So when we are in Christ and in the Lord and we know the Lord, we know God to be that. We know God to be sincere. It's not like the gods of the, of the Greeks and the Romans. You always had to watch out for those gods because they were tricky and they were not sincere. And sometimes they just did things to, to hurt you. And uh, God is not like that. God is a God who is upright. He goes on to say in 2 Samuel 22, also with the pure, you will show yourself pure. And interesting, I think it's interesting that in the Sermon on the Mount, once again, Christ says in that first sermon that the pure in heart shall see God. The pure in heart shall, be see, God, shall see God. Those whose hearts are not hypocritical. Those whose hearts are pure in their devotion to the Lord. I believe they will be blessed with greater understanding of God, of God's purity, of his perfections, of his completeness. The, uh, the pure soul is given greater glimpses into the heavenly glory. Those who are not sincere, those who are not pure, we know that sin hides the face of God from us. We know that sin is an obstruction between us and God. And we know that God, as a believer, when we are right with God and we are in communion with God and when we are following the Lord, being sincere and seeking to be set apart unto him. Those are the times in which he makes known to us his word and gives us more. He will not give us more if we are not, haven't taken what he's given us already. Those who have shall have more, the scripture says. To the pure, he shows himself pure. Uh, John was in the spirit, it says, on the Lord's Day in Revelation 1 that we've been studying. And he was given wonderful revelations of Jesus Christ, of who Jesus Christ was. To the pure, you show yourself pure. Let a man give himself to purity and he will see God as others cannot. There's something about that obedience, and we all know it. We all know it from experience, but there's something about obedience to God and trueness to God and sincerity to God and pureness of heart. There's something about that which God delights in and that there is, there is a quicker learning, there is, there is a greater you know, progress in the education of the faith uh, in the school of Christ when we are in that right state. Whereas other times we feel ourselves so deficient and, uh, and not learning like we ought if we are not right in those matters. A man who is holy will have fellowship and communion with a God who is holy. And he will see God for who he is. So God is to the saints. He's merciful. He's upright. He's pure. But to the wicked, it says, he's very different. It says... With the froward, you will show yourself, the old King James says, unsavory. It's a good word. Savory is something that you want. You want to, if you want a steak, you want one that's savory, one that tastes good. And uh, God's not going to taste good to the wicked. He's not. To the froward, to the wicked, God deal, deals with them differently. He deals differently with those who are proud, who are arrogant, who are haughty, who don't need God, who mock God. Those who want to wrestle with God in a wrong way, wrong way, God is more than willing to wrestle. And he can wrestle. And we don't have the moves that God has. We don't have the power that God has. And we can get ourselves all put up high, like he speaks of Edom in the scriptures. You make your nest up with the eagles and I'll bring you on down. I don't care how high you make your nest. I'm still over you. 
We have Haman, in a classic story, hung upon his own gallows. He made himself high, God made him low. And you want to trick God, you want to play with God, you want to play with God's people, God can make a king not be able to sleep one night and then read a passage. God has lots of ways. You want to deal with God, you want to think that you're bad, as they say in the vernacular, I'm bad, God can be bad too, in that sense, yeah. He can, he can turn you around. Pharaoh, we have Pharaoh pursuing, lying, saying you can go, and then he pursues them into the Red Sea. God brings the sea upon him. You have Joseph's brothers in the classic moment, standing and now bowing before the prime minister of Egypt. You want to think that your trick worked? And they lived with that rotten trick, and it tormented them all those years. And really, it wasn't until they met Joseph that they could find freedom if they would have it. Even though we look at the end of his life, and apparently they still were trusting in men rather than God. You have Jacob. Jacob, he's going, who is the trickster. And where does God send him? Uncle Laban. Because <laughs> un Uncle Laban's worse than he is. You know, God, God will deal with men according to their character. And, and God will use it. Now, in the life of Jacob, he's going to use it to turn him to himself. He sends him to Laban, and Laban thinks that he's really something, too. And then God turns all of the cattle out of Laban's house and brings it to Jacob by using a recessive gene within the cattle, which is a one in a million shot, and it works every single time. <laughs> so Laban thinks he's a bad guy, too. God can deal with him. Because he owns the cattle and he owns the recessive genes and he owns everything. So, the scriptures often speak, turn to Psalm 9. Let's look at a couple of passages. This is, this is a favorite imagery of David, actually. In Psalm 9. In verse 15, the heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, in the net which they hid, their own foot is taken. He uses this imagery oftentimes. With the wicked, you will show yourself unsavory. God can take you in the very net that you have laid or put in the pit that you have dug for someone else. In Psalm 10, and again verse 9, he lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. And remember, when David uses the word poor in the scriptures, often, most often, he is talking about the poor in spirit. He's talking about the believer who is surrounded by a, a wicked world. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He does catch the poor when he draws him into his net. He crouches, he humbles himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He has said in his heart, God is forgotten. He hides his face, he'll never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the humble. Why does the wicked condemn God? He has said in his heart, you will not require it, but you have seen it, for you behold mischief and spite to requite it with your hand. The poor commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man Seek out his wickedness till you can find none. Psalm 35. Psalm 35 and verse 7. For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. David, as a king, would have had a lot of conspiracies against him in various fashions, and he did, certainly with Saul, and uh, so he knew of what he speaks. Psalm 57. Psalm 57 in verse six, they have prepared a net for my steps, 
My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise to thee. So he says in our text in 2 Samuel 22 with the froward, he'll be unsavory. He deals with them according to their character. And in verse 28, he then summarizes that with these two groups of people, the afflicted people, which are the believers, and the haughty, which are the unbelievers. And the afflicted people you will save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty to bring them down. The afflicted you save. God loves his afflicted people. He does. He loves his persecuted people. He loves his saints. He loves his saints who are faithfully praying and witnessing and experiencing in this world the afflictions that come with that. So God loves his people. They are merciful. And the world mocks that mercy as a weakness. And they take advantage of the saint. But God saves his afflicted ones. They are pure, set apart to God. The world may call them self-righteous or holier than thou or Victorian killjoys or puritanical, but God loves his afflicted ones. They are upright and sincere and the world scoffs at them for being so naive that they don't know how the world works because the world works with deceit and hypocrisy, but God loves his afflicted ones and he will save his afflicted ones. But the rest of the text says that God does see the proud and the arrogant. He says, but your eyes are upon the haughty. His eyes are not just upon his saints. His eyes are also upon the wicked. His eyes are also upon the haughty. His eyes are upon the proud because they live in his dominion. He is the king over all the world, over all the universe. Nebuchadnezzar found this out. None haughtier than Nebuchadnezzar, even after he was warned, still talking about what he did and what his kingdom did, and God made him like a beast eating grass. And that's probably the greatest story of humbling that we find in the scripture to show God's eyes upon a world leader who would not give God the glory, and God took him down. Why the scripture says elsewhere that God raises up kings and he takes them down as well. He has his eyes upon the proud. He watches he watches by an unerring omniscience and omnipresence the proud. He knows their thoughts. He discerns their motives. He catalogs their deeds. And since he is holy and just and righteous, altogether he watches and works to bring the haughty down because they are a scourge in the land. They're a scourge to the people. They're a scourge if they are leaders. They're a scourge if they are the people. And God would bring them down and it is by the common grace of God that he does this to make the world even habitable for people. He makes them at times a laughing stock. He makes them a wonder in the world. Scripture talks about others passing by and hissing at them. This is the man who did not take God for his trust. This is the man who mocked God so that all pass by and hiss at them. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Solomon says in 1812, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty and before honor is humility. Chapter 21 and verse 24, proud and haughty scorner is his name who deals in proud wrath. The man of wisdom deals much with the proud and he deals with it over and over again because it's a problem. That's why he deals with it so often. I was thinking about great poems about the pride of man, Ozymandias, if you know Ozymandias, I don't know if you know that poem, it's a great poem about a, a great mighty 
uh, statue left behind by a king that's now in the, the deserts of, of Egypt. He said, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. And near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. So the, this great, mighty uh, idol that was set up is coming apart. Half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on the lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Such is the works of the king of kings who call themselves such of man. The pride of man. And the pride of man is so thoroughly ingrained in the nature of man that even as believers, we have to, we say with David, search my heart, know me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in life everlasting because so much of pride can get involved in the things that we do. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh is one of my favorite guys from English history. And uh, before his death, he wrote a poem called The Lie. And it's a great poem and don't have time. You could spend a lot of time actually on this poem. But he goes through thing after thing after thing after thing in which man is a participant in which is at least partially a lie. And his phrase that he uses over and over again, once he describes what that thing is, he says, and if they say they're not, give them the lie. Or in other words, show them to be false. Show them to be false. He says, say to the court, it glows and shines like rotten wood. Say to the church, it shows what's good and does no good. If church and court reply, give them both the lie. Tell potentates they live, acting by others' action, not loved unless they give, not strong but by a faction. And if potentates reply, give potentates the lie. Tell them, show them that they're false. Tell men of high condition that manage the estate. Their purpose is ambition. Their practice is only hate. And if they once reply, then give them all the lie. Tell them that brave it most, they beg for more by spending. Who in their greatest cost seek nothing but commending. And if they make reply, then give them all the lie. Tell zeal it lacks devotion. Tell love, it is but lust. Tell time, it is but motion. Tell flesh, it is but dust. And wish them not reply, for thou must give the lie. Tell age, it daily wasteth. Tell honor, how it alters. Tell beauty, how she blasteth. Tell favor, how it falters. And as they shall reply, give everyone the lie. Tell wit how much it wrangles in tickle points of niceness. Tell wisdom she entangles herself in overwiseness, and when they do reply straight, give them both the lie. Tell physic of her boldness. Tell skill it is pretension. Tell charity of her coldness. Tell law it is contention. And as they do reply, so give them still the lie. Tell fortune of her blindness, tell nature of decay, tell friendship of unkindness, tell justice of delay. And if they will reply, then give them all the lie. Tell arts, they have no soundness, but vary by esteeming. Tell schools, they lack profoundness and stand too much on seeming. If arts and school reply, give arts and schools the lie. Tell faith it's fled the city. 
Tell how the country erreth. Tell manhood shakes off pity and virtue least preferreth. And if they do reply, spare not to give the lie. So when thou hast, as I, commanding thee, done blabbing, although to give the lie deserves no less than stabbing, stab at thee he will, but no stab the soul can kill. Tell him the truth, he's saying. Tell him the truth. How much, how much pride enters in to all things and self-serving. Which is why in our text, the scripture says that God watches the proud and he would bring them low. He would. He would. George Meredith in his book, Lucifer by Starlight, Two phrases there, it talks about Lucifer coming over the globe, which he has by his cunning brought low. He says, where sinners hug their specter of repose. And he says, with memory of the old revolt from awe. Talking about awe this morning, full of awe. It was the memory of the old revolt. And what was the revolt that happened? They didn't, awe, God was no longer in awe to them. So David says, verse 29, you are my lamp, O Lord. You are my lamp. You are my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. So who and what is your lamp? What is your revelation? What is your guiding light? David confesses himself to have darkness and to be in darkness because David's in darkness if he doesn't have the Lord. If he doesn't have the light of God, he will be in darkness. We will all be in darkness. We know nothing outside of the Lord. If we have light, it's because the Lord has given us light, because the Lord has sent us the gospel, because the Lord has regenerated our souls, without which we would be in as much darkness as the rest of the world. We would be just as woke as they are woke. We would just be as idiotic as they are idiotic. The Lord is our lamp. The Lord is our light. And David confesses this. A lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, he says in Psalm 119. So we, we read also in the, in the book of Revelation where it talks about the seven spirits before the throne. Complete and full illumination. The, the seven spirits which are the light of God, the eyes of God. So... He says, having said that he was my lamp, look at verse 30. Very practical. David says, for by you I have run through a troop, and by you I have leaped over a wall. Here's David the warrior recalling his days in the armed forces, probably still in it at this point. And he says, by God, I ran through the troop, and by God, I leaped over the wall. Well, what do you mean, David? You were a young man, you had exercised, you had done all these things. He ascribes everything in his life to God. If I can leap over a wall, I did it by God's help. If I can get through a troop, I did it by God's help. What a practical usage that is, that God is all in all to us. That whatever we do, we ascribe it to God, not to ourselves. So I love the way he, he spoke of that. And then... Finally, in verse 31, as for God, his way is perfect. God's way is perfect and God's word is proved. This is the saint's confession. This is David's summary of all of God's dealings with him as he's been talking about God's reward and talking about how God behaves toward the saints. God's way is perfect. The saints believe that God orders all of our ways and that in all of the ways that he orders, he is perfect in what he orders. God's way is perfect, it's holy, it's just, and it's good. God's way brings God the most glory and us the most good. I do not look upon the ways of God and judge them according to the standard of my own glory or how I am exalted, but all of his ways in me according to the reverence of glory he receives through God's dealing with me. That's what's important. God's way is perfect because however he is dealing with me, he is getting a revenue of glory, and I am getting the greatest good. God's way is perfect, perfectly just, perfectly equitable. I rest in the unerring judgment of God, who sees the larger picture than myself, so that I can rest in his decisions. 
We oftentimes think a man is deficient in his judgment about a certain matter until we find out that we didn't know what he knew. And once we find out what he knew and we have the further information, then we're like, oh, okay. Well, now I understand his decision. Infinitely more with God. And, and we won't have that information, you know. Maybe in glory we will. I'm not sure that we'll need it in glory. I think we'll just see the Lord for who he is and all these little questions that bothered us will fade away. So God is perfect. He's perfect in his way. And this is not just the conclusion of saints who won all the battles like David won. It's the conclusion of Job who lost everything. And in Job chapter 42, he comes to this same conclusion long before David. Job answers the Lord and says, I know that you can do everything. No thought can be withheld from you. Who is he that hides counsel without knowledge? I have uttered what I didn't understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. And this is why we confess God's ways are perfect. Because there's things we just don't know. Here, I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare to me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, Job says, but now my eye sees you and I abhor myself in dust and ashes. <laughs> because God never answered the questions of Job. He just said, where were you when I did all these things that you know nothing about? And so Job could make the connection. I wasn't there for the foundation of the earth. I don't even understand how the earth is hung in space. I, don't, I can't even figure out and see men couldn't even see when the goats were giving birth up in the mountains and in the holes of the earth. All these things that I can't even do. And now I'm complaining about God because he did something that I don't understand. And so God gives him no answer whatsoever but to say there's a whole lot you don't understand. And it's okay. And Job says, you're right. All charges of God lacking uprightness or purity in his works towards us are dropped. Job drops them all. He saw the purity of God. He saw the integrity of God. And God's word is proved. It says his way is perfect and his word is tried or proved. David was tried in the fire seven times. He talks about the word. David talks about the word being tried in the fire seven times and coming out pure. Coming out pure. Uh, Ellicott in his commentary called it sterling gold. The word of God is sterling gold. The promises of God are only found wanting in those that have not studied the word of God. The promises of God are only found wanting in those who have not made a serious study of the word of God. Some haven't even read the word of God. They impose upon God with their finite minds what they think God should do or be bound to do. They think him bound to their law, but the creator is not bound to the creature. But that is our absurdity. God's promises, God never promises an absence of trouble. God promises trouble, actually. Man is born under the trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's the law. It's a law of physics that these sparks will fly upward, and it's a law of God that man will live in a time of trouble because it's a world of sin and rebellion. God's promises, as we have often said, are spiritual promises. They are promises of life in God. It's not the promise of the life of the rich and famous. Of course, some of us older people remember that one. Some of the young people won't remember that, that little TV program. But the life of the rich in Christ is the life of which it speaks, that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. The word of God is tried, it's proved out, and by the sincere believer who is set apart to God, he is upright, he is a merciful, he has the spirit of God living in him, he is proving out the word of God every day. Johnny Erickson, the paraplegic who has had such a wonderful ministry, says, God has wired the Christian life to be filled with pain and suffering. And coming from me, the woman in the wheelchair, I should know. 
Sure, my afflictions are different from yours, but Job 5.7 is true. It says, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. But here's the good news. Jesus is not a tour guide who chaperones you through life, merely giving you information about your suffering. Rather, he journeys with you through your valleys. When you hit the floor, feeling flat out and deflated, his face is on the floor alongside of yours. When you hurt, he feels the sting in his chest. Oh, you can go through anything if you know that God is for you, walking with you, beside you, shouldering the burden, as Psalm 68 says. Blessed is the Lord who daily bears our burdens, and those burdens include yours. Now, finally, we may think that it was easy for David to say God's way is perfect. After God had established him as king, he won all of his battles, etc., etc. But David had not lived a charmed life. <laughs> David had lived in fear of his life very early on when Saul was after him. David had been slandered by the highest authority in the land. The king was slandering David and others around him as well. David's family had to live in the dens and caves of the earth. David's family had been kidnapped along with the families of his men. And then David's men threatened mutiny and execution of David. David had ruled a divided country for many years from Hebron. David had difficult men around him, sometimes murderous men. And God sustained David, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. God persevered with David, and David persevered. Through all the flux of life, David could say, God's ways are perfect. God's ways are perfect. God's truth is tried like silver in a furnace. There's no dross in the word of God because all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So, so long as we understand the promises of God and their outworkings spiritually, we will not condemn the word of God or somehow believe that his promises have failed in some fashion. There, it cannot be. It cannot be and it is not. So we say with David, that should be our hearts, cry, your way is perfect, God. This is, where, this is where we need to be. Your way is perfect and I've proved out your word. Your word is true. There's no dross in it. Lots of dross in man's words. We know election year is coming up, but uh, not with God, not with God. So blessed, blessed be his name. Now we're going to conclude with a hymn, and then after the hymn, I'll have you be seated once again.